going live. Okay, good afternoon. It's nice to see you. Uh, my name's Claire Clinton and I'm with you this afternoon doing uh, our next Interfaith Explorers webinar, which is on the role of values education in schools uh, and community cohesion. So if you've been online before, then you will know how all of this works. But just to run through for any new people today, uh, first of all, welcome. I hope uh, your school day has been fruitful. I'm sure it's been packed and busy, as mine has been as well. Um, it's a nice day here down in uh, South or East London. Um, it's not raining, so that's good. Um, I'm not sure what the weather is like around the rest of the country, but uh, I hope you've been able to enjoy the weather today. So, um, just some practical issues. Underneath the box where you can see me talking now is somewhere where you can email in any questions you have uh, on the topic today. And we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end of uh, my presentation to answer any questions. Um, also, if you are watching this and you're not live watching it, but watching it uh, at another time, you can still email in any questions you want. And uh, Rokshana, who looks after all of this, will pass those on to me and uh, we will look to answer those as best as we can. For some of you, you will be able to see that there's also a PowerPoint presentation uh, just uh, underneath and to one side of where I'm speaking to you. And we know that some of you have that open uh, and listen to me. And others of you have printed it out and you've got that to make notes on as we go through. So uh, choose your method. If you're not watching now, you can pause me and open that up and then start me off again. So, um, as you know, Interfaith Explorers is a resource that is free for teachers to use online, uh, really to build up interfaith conversations in the classroom and also our expertise and confidence as uh, teachers, practitioners, working with children and young people. So, it's a resource that uh, can really be used uh, in upper key stage two, bottom of key stage three, uh, but also you can take ideas and uh, practices from it and use it uh, for different age groups to help uh, build up interfaith conversations. Uh, I was last week at um, my uh, National RE Advisors Conference and um, it was interesting, our keynote speaker the last two years actually has been talking about the need for religious literacy and um, I'm hoping that as we build up these conversations in our school and let young people have that ability to talk to others that their religious literacy will be built up. It's such an important skill and uh, particularly around lots of things that government wants to see schools doing well, that ability to deal with difference and uh, disagree agreeably is really important. So for those of you who don't know, uh, as I've already said my name, Claire, and I'm the RE advisor uh, down in Newham in the east end of London. And uh, I am looking out on a sunny afternoon over many houses where I am. So, um, We've got some session aims for today. Um, obviously, we're wanting to, for us to think about the role of values education, how values education contributes effectively to SMSC. That continues to be one of the judgments uh, that uh, Ofsted will look at um, and uh, refer to under leadership and management of how a school uh, is getting on around those things and to consider the relationship between uh, shared human values and our education system, which ultimately is a liberal education system, uh, and how interfaith conversations really feed into that. And I hope we can give you some practical ideas that you can try out and use in your classroom. On the website, there are many, many activities that you can choose from to help build up these conversations. So to start off first today, um, how are we going to define uh, values and particularly human values? And there are many different definitions um, and the one on the slide that you might be looking at at the moment uh, talks about how legislation is shaped by human values and it's a sort of shared idea of what is right 
uh, or what is expected in any particular society. And that's where human values uh, sort of flow from that shared expectation, shared practice, and often legislated for. So um, ultimately, values are principles or standards, uh, convictions, beliefs that people adopt as their guidelines for daily life. And so uh, you can see this relationship between values and beliefs and what we do very nicely if I say um, that I have a son and he loves Arsenal Football Club I can hear the boos from many of you who don't like football and secondly would never support Arsenal but say he, he supports Arsenal you wouldn't expect to go into his room and necessarily find another football club's logo I can tell you in this particular bedroom of uh, my son there is a calendar there is a bedspread, uh, there is a blanket, uh, there is all sorts of things in his room that tell of um, his belief that Arsenal is the best football team. Now that leads on to some values in his life. So often if he has got money that is spare, he will spend it on things, whether it's a new bit of kit uh, or whether it's going to see them play football. So his belief leads to actions and between those things we can see the things that he values, the things that he will spend his money on, the things that he spends his time doing. And so these shared human values uh, are things that a group of us in society decide are important and adopt within our daily lives. And uh, the shared human values are the sort of principles that professional ethics are based upon. And obviously, in terms of education, we have our teacher standards, and that gives us professional values that we live our lives by, our professional life by. And if we widen that out into society, then we're doing exactly the same thing. And so there are shared human values that go across people around the world. Um, the one that most people tend to agree on, um, maybe I should ask you which is the one that most people would agree on, I'll give you a moment, um, but most people would talk about treating other people the way you'd like to be treated. And I think that's because that teaching has been foundational in many uh, religions around the world and therefore has had that influence within rules and regulation legislation within countries around the world. And so whether you're religious or not, you often find that value being one spoken of. In our last uh, webinar, we had Paul Kaufman, uh, who leads the uh, Humanist Association in Wanstead. And he was talking about that being a driving value for him uh, to judge what's right and what's wrong and how to live his life, that being treating others the way he would want to be treated. And that's a really important value. So we have many shared values, but just to think about how do these values happen in a child's life. Uh, children's lives, as we know, are not lived in a vacuum, but have many different influences. And if you look to the next slide on your PowerPoint, you'll see that I've just named six potential uh, people or organisations that nurture values uh, in the lives of children. As you would expect, you have got parents and friends and society. And within society, we've got teachers. Uh, most children attend a school. Most children are not homeschooled. And so we have teachers. We also have children's peer group. Um, and uh, they influence and nurture values in a different way from friends. Friends are often people that you share things with, but that peer group can often come in and challenge and make you consider things differently. So they're also an important uh, point of um, recognizing that these people, these peers in children, young people's lives are getting them to think about what they value. And finally, I've put religious leaders. Now, for a child that comes from a family that have a religious faith, a philosophical faith, then um, those people will be of standing within the child's life. And uh, in a sense, there may be holy books as well that are coming in there.
But also, I think, if we take it more philosophically, then um, if you're humanist, uh, or maybe an atheist, there are still people of standing within that wider community that you might listen to, that might influence your thinking. Um, and obviously, in terms of society, we have newspapers and television that is doing that, that's putting uh, things over in a certain way. Nothing is value-free. There is no neutral ground. Um, and so the way we perceive the world, the way we understand the world, uh, comes through uh, the values that have been given to us by our parents and our friends and our society, um, but also uh, are being built up continually and being reviewed. So um, it's never going to be school's responsibility uh, to give exactly what values children should have, but it is a school's responsibility to develop a child spiritually, morally, socially and culturally, and particularly in that spiritually and morally part of SMSC, values education has a really important part to play. Now on the next slide, I've taken uh, a visual uh, off uh, a website that looks at values education. And you'll see that there's five main um, ideas of different shared human values. Uh, right conduct, peace, truth, love, and nonviolence. Now, it's not saying that everybody in the world would uh, consider those, but if we look under nonviolence, that consideration, cooperation, stewardship, loyalty, active citizenship, justice and respect are the values that are going on there. And actually, even in organizations like uh, the army, uh, they have chaplains. And I was talking uh, last month to one of the Buddhist chaplains that work for the armed forces for the British government. And one of the students that I took to the Vihara to talk to uh, this man sort of said, how can a Buddhist who believes in peace and nonviolence work for the Army, Navy and Royal Air Force? And uh, the Buddhist uh, leader was talking about the fact that actually most of um, the values of the army are these things around consideration, mutual respect, cooperation, stewardship, loyalty, uh, justice, respect. And actually these were all things as a good Buddhist he could sign up to. And actually where violence came in, violence came in as a very last resort. There were many, many more things that the Army, the Navy and the British Air Force were involved in uh, with humanitarian work, getting aid to people, medical supplies, um, setting up shelters, all sorts of things. And he was saying those are the bits you don't tend to see or hear in the news. What you tend to see is the conflict. Um, but there's very little of that uh, in the work where he uh, is there for soldiers to talk through. Um, and there to support them uh, morally and spiritually through the work that they're doing. And I found that really interesting um, that someone like him was in the midst of an organisation like that, saying actually the shared human values are really important. And uh, the first one, right conduct, that sounds, uh, well it is, it's one of the Buddhist uh, principles of living your life, that you consider others and uh, this idea of treating others the way uh, you would like to be treated. So whether that's about your manners, whether it's about health, whether it's about helpfulness, all of those things, that right conduct is really important. So I find that grid really useful when I'm thinking about as a school, what are we doing to impact children's lives and to build them up? If I take something from a fundamental British values document, it, we're building them up to make a positive contribution into life in modern Britain. And honesty, determination, fairness, generosity, compassion, loyalty, self-discipline, thankfulness, all these values are values that go across philosophical and religious beliefs. Actually, whether you believe in God or not doesn't matter around these values. There is something that is shared by human beings that we say these things are important. Therefore, these are the sorts of values that we need to look to see how are we building these up in children, how are we nurturing them within our school 
And you will have many, many opportunities where you're doing that. And it won't simply be because you look at them in RE, it won't simply be because they're being covered in PSHE or citizenship, or within collective worship assemblies. Actually, cooperation is going on in maths. Yeah, um, Active citizenship is going on outside the classroom when children are putting something on. I was in a, a school yesterday and uh, they were looking to raise some money for a local children's hospice. And so what they were doing was they were seeing between one class and the other who could make the longest line of one piece, two piece and five piece. And so they were collecting one piece, two piece and five piece of all sorts of people to make this long line of coins uh, to see which class could uh, get the furthest. And so that's some active citizenship. And it is, isn't happening in their lessons. It's happening because of something they've been educated about, that they're wanting to do something around it. And a teacher has found a fun and engaging way uh, to help those children to be part of that process. So my next question was, what is the value of values? Um, and it's really important to think how we're doing this within the curriculum, within the extracurricular opportunities that we offer, but also within our school policies. And our school policies will back up lots of these values. So fairness the way that a child is even allowed to uh, be booked a place on uh, a PE club, an after school club, an arts club. It won't be because the teacher decides they like Amy and they don't like, I don't know, Abigail. Uh, it will be either a first come, first serve process, or some schools will look and see at how many clubs children have been on. And if there's a child who's trying to get on and hasn't got on things in the past, they might go to the top of the list before people who've already been part of some of these clubs. So we have systems and processes in place because actually we believe fairness is important. We also have often open uh, documents that parents uh, and other people in the community can see via our websites in school. And this is because we're wanting to share openly the principles that we decide how the school is going to run. So within the curriculum, yes, you will be teaching about human values uh, in RE, PSHE and citizenship and assemblies, but you'll also be doing them in other subjects as well. And what's important is teachers being able to identify these values and when they're doing them and how they're helping children to grow in them and to reflect on where they're at with them. Uh, because where we're at with something like um, being trustworthy when we're five can be very different from where we're at when we're 10 and can be very different where we're at when we're 14. And so children should be asked to look back to consider and to make that plan for the future. Now, we're talking about these shared human values. Um, I, is this something different from fundamental British values? Well, yes and no. Um, fundamental British values, as you know, is something that the government uh, decided that Ofsted was going to look for from September uh, 2014 in our schools and uh, to check that these values were being taught. And so some of them, in terms of mutual respect and tolerance, are absolutely the same shared human values. But some of the others are systems and um, not particularly values, but within them there are some values. So for instance, democracy isn't a value, it's a system. But within our system of democracy, there is that value that every human being is important. Everybody has a right at a certain age to have a legal say in the future of the country by deciding who governs it. Um, and that has a value within it. And that's something not necessarily shared across the world that every person has that value, but it's something definitely shared within our country and wider Europe and in many other countries around the world. So there is a relationship between shared human values and fundamental British values. And I suppose human values are wide and fundamental values are a bit smaller, a bit narrower, part of that. Um, but I think schools can really benefit from 
thinking about that wider remit of values and uh, not just thinking about the five that uh, we've been given from the government, which is democracy, the rule of law, individual liberties, tolerance and mutual respect. Because some of these other values, like creativity and honesty, self-discipline, uh, uh, independence, perseverance, are also really important values for children to be able to do that second part that the fundamental British values is trying to do, to get children to be the best possible person they can be, so they can make a positive contribution into life in modern Britain. And it's that life in modern Britain that actually the five that we have from the government are not wide enough to cover all of those uh, children and the types of contributions they can make. And as you know, with anything with Ofsted, we need to have the impact evidence. So how, when we're teaching about perseverance, where do we teach that within our curriculum? about keeping going. And maybe it's uh, an attitude that we ask children to have another go. It might be through our diagnostic marking where we're asking another question and expecting and following through that children have answered those questions. Uh, it may be through assemblies. There may be all sorts of places in PE that they don't give up just because something's hard or in maths, but that we understand that children are on this journey and what we need to collect is little bits of evidence of where that perseverance education is making a difference. So what sort of things does it mean that children can do that they couldn't do before, that they can do now? And why does that help them to live life in modern Britain? So just a, a point about British education. And I think because I've been educated in Britain, uh, uh, sometimes you don't always recognize uh, the values that you hold and our British education system uh, is built upon uh, a Western liberal education understanding which means in practice that we're often using uh, critical realism uh, to consider and evaluate different bits of evidence and points of view so we will look at something and we will think uh, was that good? Wasn't that good? Why? And what's the criteria that we're using to make judgments? And our education system is wanting young people to be challenged in their thinking and for us to give them different points of view, uh, whether we're talking about economics uh, or whether we're talking about religion. It's not just the vanguard of RE or PSHE or citizenship. Um, this education system is important that we're open to new ideas to people who say things that maybe we don't agree with and that we need to think through logically what are our reasons for and against this now we we did a webinar a few months ago on critical thinking and how important critical thinking is uh, in terms of helping children with these interfaith conversations and so if you missed that one i just encourage you to go back to that one because actually that's at the the basis of our education system that we know that children who can ask good questions children who are open about their learning um, it doesn't mean that they're going to change their views but they're going to either deepen their views because they're going to find out the reasons for them or they're going to adapt their views because their reasons or the reasons given to them for certain things don't weigh up, they don't make any sense. Um, and that's really important. So just to draw your attention on the slide, you'll see uh, the Three Face Forum, uh, which is uh, a charity that uh, works in all sorts of places now, but originally sort of started in the East End of London. Um, and uh, they've produced a booklet and we've given you uh, the, the web address for having a look at that. But just saying that pupils from different backgrounds need to interact with one another to build up tolerance and understanding. So my question for you at the end of the year is this year, if you take your class or the phase group that you're part of, um, how many different faiths or how many different beliefs did your pupils encounter during uh, their school year with you? Okay, is it one, two, three, how many? 
And um, what's been the impact of those encounters? Because actually, if we're having proper conversations, there will be impact from those. If we're just giving them information, there isn't always the impact. Anyway, the Three Faiths Forum I thought was interesting because uh, this document that I would um, encourage you to go and have a look at uh, says there's some principles of good practice. And one of them is that schools have to move beyond multiculturalism uh, towards uh, intercultural education. Okay, so our schools traditionally have been very good at celebrating different days and we do that well. But it's saying actually we've got to begin to engage with the differences between beliefs, not just celebrating. So that's often a starting point. Uh, that you start by celebrating, uh, getting people to know about something in greater detail. But that isn't the end of it. The report's saying it needs to move on. And pupils need to be taught skills uh, to deal effectively with controversial issues. And this is so important. Uh, there's lots of really good advice that you can still get to that was written uh, for PSHE and RE about handling controversial issues in the classroom. If you Google that, you'll find uh, PDFs of that advice, which was excellent. But education needs to equip children and young people uh, to tackle issues that are being faced in local communities, whether that's inter-religious tensions or whether that's prejudice between different groups. And multiculturalism uh, does starts on that, but it doesn't follow through necessarily the whole way. And that's what this report is saying. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, last Monday and Tuesday, I was at uh, my RE Advisors Conference and um, there was a lady there called Barbara Usher and uh, she has run a very successful interfaith uh, community group uh, from her school, which has involved students from her school over a number of years and she won a national prize for her innovative uh, RE teaching in 2003. And I've just put a couple of quotes uh, that she said. I'll let you have a moment to have uh, a read of them. But she was talking about the impact of this group and how interfaith dialogue equips young people not only with the skills of dialogue, <laughs> which is really important, um, but appreciation of diversity. So, okay, the skills of dialogue and it gets them to know a little bit more about different faiths and different philosophies, but it's that appreciation of diversity that's important, that their view is not the only way that somebody understands or sees the world. The way that things happen in their family isn't the only way that things happen uh, in families across the world. And she said interfaith conversations are so important because it allows students to have personal involvement and it allows students to be influence affected and even altered by an encounter. And she was saying if there's real dialogue going on, then you're always going to be influenced, affected or altered by an encounter. And this gives me um, almost like one of those um, sort of uh, things going up your spine. It gives me tingly feeling because this is the exciting bit uh, of working with young people and, uh, and children is when they begin to really open up and really talk about things. And she was saying for her group for a long time before they got into controversial issues, before they got... Um, to talk about some of the things that you can't just resolve between religions. Uh, ultimately, she gave the example of who Jesus is. And she said, you know, Muslims at that group understand that Christians disagree with them as to who Jesus is, and so do Jewish people. Um, and for Hindus and Sikhs, that didn't seem to be so much of an issue. Um, but for these three groups, they have very different views on who Jesus is and his importance and beliefs about him. And she was saying good faith conversations doesn't cover that up. 
It allows people to express that, but it also allows people to understand why someone believes what they do and therefore appreciate that difference. And she was saying that she felt her students and young people who come along to this group were much more resilient characters as a result of these conversations. So uh, what sort of activities promote uh, values education? Well, talking and listening, obviously, any opportunity where children are listening and then can respond or talk about themselves and respond, uh, those things are going to build up those skills of talking about difference. Obviously, encountering people from different faiths and philosophies, races and cultures. Um, I was with the chair of my student SACRE group, my interreligious group, uh, that uh, seven schools are part of at the moment uh, in Newham, uh, year nines and year tens. And she was talking uh, about this last year and a project that we've been doing about organising some lessons that they went on to offer into primary schools. So these are year nines, year tens going in and, and leading an RE lesson. And uh, she said the most interesting thing was meeting Paul, uh, the, uh, the humanist, and his sister Ruth, because in her family and wider community, she had never really got to know somebody who could talk about their humanist beliefs, their atheist um, belief stance on the world, and yet made sense as to why they believed what they did and their guiding principles for making decisions. And she's talked again and again about the impact of that. So that now, even in her classroom, where there aren't those views necessarily, she will bring up what she's learned from those conversations. And that shows how encountering difference is really important. Um, using scenarios is a great thing to build up these activities, uh, particularly around possible interreligious, uh, interphilosophical conflicts, and then asking students to problem solve. As we know, this is really helping them with speculative thinking, so it's pushing them critically uh, in their brain development, but also looking at the consequences of these possible solutions, so that we do that, and that really helps towards interfaith conversations. And on uh, the Interfaith uh, Explorers website, there are lots and lots of examples. But just to give you one, have a look at the Making Choices Guide and the Learning uh, Unit section on values. And that will give you some really practical activities you could try out even this week with your class. And do keep encouraging your class to ask questions. Uh, even if it's a question you can't answer, you can still be happy that someone's asked it to you and uh, say, right, we're going to have to think about that. I'm going to have to think about it and find that time for that question not to be lost, but to come back to it at another point. Just uh, summing up now, um, you'll see that I've put uh, a SWOT analysis template. And that's really because I think with values education, you've got to think, Okay, what's our school doing well at? Where are the possible weaknesses? What opportunities could we take hold of uh, with our wider community? And are there any threats that would affect our present practice? So I think um, best practice on values education is to understand that our pupils are going to be part uh, of British society and we want them to be an active and positive uh, part of that society. So therefore nurturing critical thinking in our pupils is really important. Giving them opportunities outside of their family, family um, and where they live that they can look at things in the wider community but also that they're meeting different ethnic groups, different cultural groups, different religious groups and that they can mix well uh, and show respect. To do those two things is quite hard, it's complex to mix well and show uh, respect. And ultimately that if pupils can disagree agreeably uh, you know, that they don't have to fall out, they don't have to look at uh, wiping each other out off the face of the earth because they have a different viewpoint, then in a sense, I think we're being successful in what the British education system is requiring of us as teachers. Okay, 
So that's the end of what I was going to say on values education. I hope that's made some sense. Um, and we're just going to see if we've got any questions. Aha, uh -huh. we have a couple of questions. Thank you very much. Um, how do you deal with a pupil who doesn't initially display uh, the behaviour of values? Okay, so somebody who's really not prepared to listen, which is our fundamental starting place. Um, I think it takes time to build these things up and some children can enter into our schools from certain situations uh, where they are either needing a lot of attention or they haven't been part of a system where they are used to getting a lot of attention. And so use and deployment of your teaching assistant is very important around this, where somebody can coach them, sit with them, help them to be patient, to wait their turn, uh, to keep them thinking and listening and engaged. Um, I think as well, um, children when they're part of a larger community and this is why i would say acts of collective worship and assembling children together bigger than their class is so important because if there's an expectation that everybody walks quietly into that hall children uh, might not do that initially but once that's been flagged up to them and they understand the seriousness of why we're doing that and why that's important they will often just follow into the crowd so I can remember um, in my early days of being an RE advisor here in Newham, uh, I went to a secondary school and they said, we're going to have a moment to reflect. And in this hall, there was nearly a thousand students. And at that point, they all just looked down, they folded their hands on their legs and uh, they just had a moment of stillness and quiet. And it was very, very powerful for me in the room because there was this shared way of doing something, the shared value of silence. Now that would not have appeared the day before I arrived. That was long-term practice that I could see going on there. And it was excellent and outstanding practice. And that's because the school had built up that value of saying reflection was important, the children understood why, and actually this is what everyone does. And they will often uh, follow along. Often we, another question about how do you deal with parents who undermine values education? I think they have to be educated in uh, the British system and what we're trying to do. Um, unfortunately, sometimes you do have to make it clear for parents that there are choices around education. They can privately educate, and some people do that on religious grounds and philosophical grounds because they want their children to be educated with a particular value or a set of values uh, right up front and in centre. Also, you can homeschool. And again, people do that for a variety of reasons. But if you are entering into state education, local authority education, then you are coming under the values of British society. And actually, that means if, if you as a family don't hold to that, you have to understand that your child is going to be taught that that's an important value. And in a sense, it's not for the school to reconcile that. Uh, the school has to do what the school has to do. But there is a, a chance with homeschool visits and uh, on uh, special occasions where schools will bring families in to help them understand about reading or mathematics, that you can talk about these principles with parents and get them on side so they're understanding what the school has to do and why these values are important. Sometimes parents do need education as well, and I say that as a parent, that um, I'm often learning new things about how to parent better and well, and to understand the way that we do something isn't the only way to do something. And uh, I think our final question today, uh, how do you drive uh, values and ethics um, or day-to-day -day practice amongst teachers and staff in the community? There's a real opportunity here around um, maybe your thought for the week, your value for the week, um, uh, or your theme for the week. And uh, in the school where I have my office, they have a, a value or a thought for the week. Um, and so one week it might be courage. And we're looking at that, whether we're in early years, key stage one, key stage two. Um, I also know in my uh, son's schools that they do a very similar thing. So they're looking at that at key stage three and key stage four. And um, 
very practically, some schools will have those thoughts or those values uh, on the home screen for every teacher and on the interactive whiteboard. So it's there as a little reminder that what we're doing this week is we're thinking about this idea, we're considering this thought, we're considering how does this impact in our lives, how can we grow better at doing this. And that uh, approach helps to remind staff um, but I do think teachers do need uh, professional opportunities where they can reflect and think about how they can do these things better to join up the dots. Uh, there's a lot of things that teachers are having to do on a daily basis. Um, and sometimes we just have a point, need a point where we can join up those dots and make sense of that bigger picture. And I would say that values education is really important for children's development and young people's development. And particularly if we want them to make that positive contribution into our society, uh, whatever they decide to be and whoever they end up being, um, we want them to be making positive contributions. And that would be my point for saying why values education and shared human values is such an important thing to build up in schools. So um, always find time for those conversations within the curriculum. So that's it for today. Thank you very much for being with us. We're going to have a break over the summer, but we return in September. And uh, we're hoping that um, Mr Evans will be with us. I'm just looking to one side. He's a very busy man with a very busy diary. But we do hope that we'll get hold of him or someone else from the department who can come and answer questions. Um, particularly, some of you will be very interested with the latest advice come through uh, on preventing things and that relationship with schools. So do have a good summer. Be refreshed and revived, ready for a new year and more opportunities of helping young people to explore faith and to explore different beliefs.